Hi. Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. We have Benjamin Freeman, and he is a renaissance man. And what I mean by renaissance man is that he actually has a cocktail of things that he does. He's an entrepreneur. He's a writer. He's authored books. He is a peace activist. He has done it all throughout his life. And today he's here to tell us a little about himself, what he's currently doing. And he's here to teach us some things that are going to open our mind and get us out of that gray box. So Benjamin, tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Well, you forgot that I'm an inventor. I have two yes. solar car patents. Anyway, the way to start is what's different about me than almost anybody is since I've been a teenager, I've wondered why humanity with the potential for universal abundance created by modern technology and our common desire for connection, love and empathy lives in this alienating world. Yeah. And I spent my whole life figuring out why how we can most easily change it, and then connecting my ideas to other things. I would put it this way. From the time I was a teenager until 30, I was looking at it from just little things I read in a purely secular direction. And I really wasn't specific. I was generally answering the question. Right. And I used to speak publicly, and I have recently too. I've always been publicly on the topic of cooperation, which is probably from my other people that have interviewed, the most interesting part of our discussion, that yeah. I have theories about cooperation, which I'll get into, but I was speaking about them. And I hate to be sound cynical, but I realized from questions people gave me, I was born like an agnostic Jew, that Jesus said a lot of things that were similar to mine. And I had never read the New Testament because I was a Jew and agnostic. So I read the New Testament and it suddenly hit me that this was written on two levels. That's why Jesus spoke in parables. Mm -hmm. One level was for pre-modern people. And then at the close of the age with we're at, there was a different level. That's why it's a little confusing. And the moment I figured out how you could be sure what Jesus' message was for our time, I got a voice in my head, which I am still sure was God. Mm -hmm. And he said, it was the moment I figured out how to interpret the Bible. He said, read the Quran. It's my book of clarifications and amplifications. Now, even though I'm, I'm talking about not being religious, I always felt an affinity for Buddha's work. And I'd always read Buddha stuff and whatever. And so I read the Quran and like most scientifically oriented, Westerners, I realized that the part of the Bible that might need correction would be Genesis. Mm -hmm. Because you know how atheistic scientists and religious people right. say there's a discrepancy. Yeah. And amazingly, the Quran corrects it. My book goes into that. We only have so much time. I don't want to get into the details. That's the main point of my introduction, how specifically it does it. But the reason God did it, I now see, is that the Quran clarifies a lot of ambiguities in the Bible. And there's some fundamentals that say, oh, there's no ambiguities. It's obvious there are ambiguities because all the different preachers and denominations have different interpretations. Right. And the Quran clarifies them. And if I told you, say you were a very religious woman, I don't know if you are, what you say one of my clarifications, you'd say, well, that's just Muhammad's opinion. It doesn't mean mm -hmm. anything more than yours, except you know that Muhammad, rep Muhammad said he didn't write the Quran. He said the angels gave it to him, which right. is in fulfillment of two biblical prophecies. And the answer I can give you, which no one could have given 500 years ago, because Muhammad himself told Christians and Jews that mm -hmm. he was that, is that how could he have known what was wrong with Genesis and how to correct it? Remember, he wrote the Quran in 700 AD, before mm -hmm. Darwin, before Einstein, even before Copernicus and Galileo. 
How did he know to correct things? He knew because he didn't write it. Angels wrote it. And they put the corrections in to clarify for postmodern humanity. Mm -hmm. You know, what the correct interpretations of a variety of biblical stories are. And my book actually is focused on four key biblical stories. The Adam and Eve story, the Noah's Ark story, the crucifixion, and revelations. Mm -hmm. And in all four, the Quran clarifies it. Now, as my book shows, you don't have to believe the Quran to believe my interpretations. But, you know, without the Quran, anyone who reads it will say, well, it's your idea. I mean, and other people had some ideas too, but it's not for sure. Right. But if it's true that Muhammad got the Quran from the angels, who, who clarified Genesis in the Quran just to prove they had the right to clarify everything else, then Muhammad's clarifications of these four crucial stories have to be taken seriously. Right. So the first two thirds of my book, Becoming Angels in Paradise, is I overlay and I bring in Eastern religions and secular evidence that's mm -hmm. related. Right. I overlay all these things, anthropology, history, everything, to sort of explain how my basic theory, and if you look at the, in a funny way, the back of my book is almost more important than the front. If I can read from my back says, this book shows how modern technology and knowledge allows us to become angels in paradise by adopting the following key behavioral teachings of the most revered religious founders. Now, before I get list them, well, you can read the book to list them. I want to say something. You know, people say, whether they're religious or not, whether they're Hindu or Jewish or whatever, say, well, but all the religious founders said different things. From years of overlaying their teachings on each other, I realize about the things most people think are important, they do say different things. They don't disagree, mm -hmm. but they agree things. But about the most important thing, which is how humans should behave, yes. they all say the same thing. They can be summarized. My book is a long list, but since it's shorter here, with one sentence, give more, take less, and lovingly serve the greater good. That's what they all teach. Exactly. And in fact, modern technology makes it useful for us to adapt by acting that way. Mm -hmm. Now we get to what is really the most important point of all my speeches and other things like this. When I talk about the same thing Jesus talked about, we should be more cooperative, compassionate, whatever. What most people say, even people who call themselves great Christians, well, in theory, that's right. But it doesn't work. People aren't cooperative enough. Yeah. My answer to that, and this isn't just founded in religious teaching, it's founded in science. Yeah. If you, if you consider us an animal and you study animal relations with each other, mm -hmm. It is absolutely not true the way people sort of summarize Darwin and his teachings of evolution. It is not true that being more vicious and more evil actually always helps an animal. The right. truth is that animals adapt to their circumstances. Mm -hmm. And if it's useful for them to be cooperative, animals are and that that includes insects it includes other mammals and it includes humans yeah. the reality is that for most of our existence we're hunter gatherers mm -hmm. and anthropological studies of hunter gatherer which are supplemented by actual studies of the few hunter gatherer tribes that still exist is that hunter gatherers are actually far more cooperative with their own communities than we are Mm -hmm. How did so? It's we that are the exception. Everyone thinks human nature is uncooperative. Human nature is predatory. What's the point of talking about a better world? It's unrealistic. But actually, we, meaning mankind, in the last three thousand years, we're the exception. Like a key thing we talk about is greed. Not only is greed not part of human nature, but no animal, including humans, before two thousand BC ever existed anything close to the greed that even people that aren't considered greedy exhibit. Yeah. I mean, this is like just 
modern man, and by modern, I'm talking about the last couple thousand years, yeah. that acts that way. And it's similar about violence. Yes, all animals are violent. Humans are violent, but not in the same way we are. Right. We're the only animal that basically kills for very little reason. Mm -hmm. 90% of all animal killing is because they need it to survive. Right. Either killed to get something to eat, but they need to eat it, or they kill to protect themselves from being yeah. killed. It's very rare that animals kill just with no real gain. Mm -hmm. You know, people who disagree with me, because I've given so many speeches, I know what all the arguments are, will say, yeah, but don't other mammals have male dominance rituals that have fights? Yes, they do, but if you study them carefully, and all experts say this, with rare exceptions, they're just almost like play fighting in the sense that they, they fight until it's obvious who would win and the loser gives up. Yeah. It's very rare that, that animal dominance rituals, whether among males or females, get to the point of killing. Right. You know, and so our level of violence and greed are totally, and the whole story that we're that way, that's absolutely only had to do with us. Well, then you ask, well, why are we so much worse than we were and other animals are? You know, it had to do with a weird set of circumstances. Mm -hmm. And this just proves adaptation. People say that the foundation of civilization is basically in the Middle East and to a lesser extent in the Indus Valley in India. The only reason they're considered the cradle of civilization is they developed nation states. And the essence of nation states began with the fact that if you imagine you're in the Nile Valley, which is the best example of this. The Nile Valley itself is very lush. I've been in Egypt in the Nile. Yeah. But once you get 20 miles past the Nile Valley, you're in the desert. Yeah. And so animals or people that lived in the desert when they saw the first agricultural settlement in the Nile Valley, obviously they came in and tried to steal the food because <laughs> they were starving. And the people yeah. in the Nile Valley weren't the same in the Middle Eastern, like other Middle Eastern places. Right. And so what happened was that those communities created defensive militia, not to hurt anybody, to protect themselves. Right. But after a few decades, some of the heads of the defensive militias said, you know what? I could use these defensive militias to enrich myself. Right. I can overpower the other people in my community and I can use them to take over other communities and steal their wealth. Right. And that was the beginning of the predatory nature of modern ham because a few, when a few societies started it, obviously other societies had to act the same way or else they'd be conquered. Right. So it gradually spread to the whole world. And that is why we are so much more greedy and predatory toward our own kind mm -hmm. than other animals. But here's why we could adopt. It's not just that Jesus told it to and Buddha told it to. It's that it did sort of make sense in the pre-modern era. Because most people were basically self-sufficient farmers. And so they really didn't need to pray on anyone or be prayed on anybody. But obviously they were easy targets for people that were a little rougher, thugs, and more importantly, right. the ruling class. Yeah. But in the modern era, the whole system of one person or group preying on another is causing more problems than benefits. Yeah. The most obvious problem is why Einstein made the, what I consider the leading remark of the modern age when he said, with the splitting of the atom, Everything has changed except man's way of thinking, and thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. His point was, if we continue acting in this predatory, selfish way, yeah. the world's going to blow up. Yeah. And he only knew about nuclear weapons. Now we have global climate change and artificial intelligence. I mean, there's so many other things that are the same. So one motivation for the change is if we don't, we're going to destroy the earth. But the other motivation, which didn't exist hundreds of years ago, is our economies are so interdependent. Very few people in the world, including you and me, yeah. do anything 
that has a value in itself. Mm -hmm. You, for instance, you have a, you told me about a great woman, you all these books and everything, but nothing you do could have any value if there weren't all sorts of support people, the people right. that run your Zoom meeting, the people that buy your books, all these other people. And that's true of everybody. Right. Even farmers are no longer self-sufficient. Nowadays, farmers rely on people to sell them, you know, all these different machinery or whatever to make their farms work. Right. So everyone is interdependent. And it's clearly obvious that once you're interdependent, it makes more sense to cooperate. Yes. But it's not just obvious. If you look at the animals that blaze the trail for us, mm -hmm. and people laugh at this, but it's true, you look at the social insects. The social insects, particularly ants and termites, are the only societies that are comparable to us in numbers. They're little, but still billions of them. Yeah. And they have found through millions of years of trial and error, the way in which they're the most efficient is that everyone has specialized work functions and they share. And that's exactly what Christ's point was. Right. We should, we should share. We should love. That's what Buddha's point, Motsu's. That's the point. Yeah. And if we did that, we would all benefit. The reason people don't want to do it, they think, well, I'll lose. If you look at it from an individual point of view, mm -hmm. there is an argument even now. Right. But if you look at it from a global point of view, we all would be better off if we developed a much more cooperative world, both because it'd be more efficient and yeah, because we'd yeah. avoid catastrophe, but also because we'd be happier because basically humans want to love each other and want to care about each other and want yeah. to feel like So we have three major motivations to change. So the, the first two thirds of my book is all about that. But the set last third is about a specific, carefully calibrated plan for us to change. Right. And that plan, I believe the first step, and I say this for a lot of logical reasons, but also because I believe the Bible predicts this, yeah. is to create world peace. Mm -hmm. And the reason that's the first step is there's something huge we could do that is actually in everybody's interest. Right. I mean, look at our current state where we have the war in the Ukraine and the war in Gaza and all these other wars simmering. Yeah. Nobody benefits. Nobody. Everybody realizes that just say the Ukraine had won, that could be the worst thing for the world. You know, he might have used nuclear weapons. And it'd be the same thing with us. If us in China get in a war, you know, it might develop nuclear weapons. And everyone talks about, I've been reading about artificial intelligence enemies for 30 years and all the real experts do say that the odds are very high that they will take the world away from us but they don't really talk about why the why isn't that a1s are going to be evil if they're going to look at our world and say if we let them keep running the world they're going to wreck the world we live in this world too right but if we acted more cooperatively they would be happy to cooperate with us the mm -hmm. reality is that cooperation and compassion are the key Right. And that's what we have to do, which leads to something you said you like friendly arguments. I would like to say about most of the people you interview, and I've met lots of people like this. I agree with those who say it's good to get personal growth. Of yeah. course, it's good. But the limitation is it's very hard for an individual to act lovingly in a world where it's taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Which leads to Christ saying about the good Samaritan altruist, and then I'll shut up and let you talk. I've been doing a lot of talking. You know, the problem with being good Samaritan is that you might become the exploited victim, but that's only the problem for an individual. Yeah. If we all were good Samaritans, that would be paradise. Yes. So what do you think of what I said so far? I actually agree with a lot of the things you say. I think you're right on target. You have a great argument. And, you know, I my, grand, my grandfather always used to say, all roads lead to one God. And the, the one thing I find is that, you know, people will work together 
until s something happens, let's say a snowstorm or something, you know, something, something's going to happen. People then become savagers and they fight for what's best for them, you know, and they forget about that love and the cooperation and the sharing part. And they, it's all about me, 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 you know, I, I got to do what's best for me. And then we go back to that scavenger where you talk about animals, you know, in the wild and looking what's best for them in certain circumstances and environments. But, you know, this has been going on for years, for centuries, and it's... it's Well, forever, for a million forever, years. For millions of years, and it's it's gotten nowhere. And it, it doesn't take an intellectual person to realize that war and fighting leads to nothing. It, it just, it, it just... It's and an it's also inefficient economically. That's right. That's my yeah. point. And so, if I may add one thing to what we're saying... So you're agreeing with me, but if some third person sitting there and said, oh, you're crazy, it wouldn't work. I have one other thing that I learned. I have an actual plan to end war. And because of that, I've met people that were prime ministers, lots of very high level people. And I've given all my speeches on cooperation to regular people. And I've talked to people like you. And, I've... and what I found, whether I'm talking about world peace or individual kindness, is almost everybody says, I would like to live that way, mm -hmm. but the world, other people don't. And here's my other answer for that. Yeah. And this is, if you remember one thing for me, since you know most of my stuff anyway, remember this to tell other people. What people, in this case, what people think about themselves is more relevant than what they think about the other guy. And here's why. You're judging everyone else that they're going to get negative, like you're talking about, based on their behavior. Mm -hmm. And judging by behavior, all of us have the potential to go the negative way. Right. But you're judging your, your own desire to be cooperative based on what you know is in your heart. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, in your heart is more important than your behavior, as proven by the fact that I'm sure if I knew you personally, I could bring up examples where you're not cooperative. And you say, well, I feel forced to do that. That's what everybody thinks. Mm -hmm. All of us in our heart prefer to be more cooperative and loving. And that's our true self. Yeah. That's more important than behavior. Because behavior is how we react to circumstances. Right. People, like all animals, adapt to circumstances. We live in a world where it's good to be a predator, so people are predatory. We live in a world where you benefit by being greedy, so people are greedy. But if we lived in a world which wasn't like that, when I went to college, it was when Skinnerian psychology was in vogue. Mm -hmm. And even though now gays it's sort of passed away, I really like that I was taught Skinnerian psychology because his basic point, which he proved with rats, which we think of as dirty, disgusting animals, is if you reward a rat for being any form of behavior that he possibly mm -hmm. can be. And I don't mean just cooperative. I mean, for jumping up on his hind legs, for, right. you know, talking, you know, being nice to the other sex or being any form of behavior, you right. reward him with food, he'll exhibit it. And, and if you punish him for a behavior, he'll stop doing it. Mm -hmm. And it's not 100% right, but basically that's, the trick, everybody feels rewarded for being selfish and predatory, so we act that way. So the trick, which now gets to my other third of my book, the last third, is we have to have a carefully calibrated system to move from the where we are now towards where we want to be. Mm -hmm. If I told you the steps which are in the book, you'd say, well, it's theoretically good, but why do people do it? They do it because they want to do it. It's like the movie. Do you remember the movie with um, Al Pacino? Was the, no, it wasn't Al Pacino. Tom Cruise was a lawyer. And who was a big star was the head of Bravo Company in, in um, Cuba. Mm -hmm. uh, as, you know, and Cruz is a fancy lawyer. And he goes, yeah, but I can't, you know, they obviously are not guilty, my clients. The only way I can prove it is get the colonel to admit that he did something illegal. Yeah. So he told me the lawyer, he said, wait a minute. 
we have this wrong. He wants to admit it. He wants to say he, he doesn't care what those snothead nerds think. Yeah. He wants to say it. And he got him to say it. Well, it's the same thing. We all want to be more cooperative and loving. So it's just a question of, of taking steps one after the other in that direction. It's not easy, but it can be done. And that's my book, <laughs> Becoming Angels in Paradise. I love it. But what happens, you know, 70% of the people in our society come from dysfunctional families and environments. When you come from a dysfunctional family and an environment, you don't sometimes realize that the behavior that you're exemplifying is bad because this is how you grew up. This is how you were taught. It's embedded in your brain. And you don't realize that it's not a healthy behavior. It's not a healthy action. It's not a healthy thought. So you repetitively repeat that behavior. But how do you get to the point when you have, especially now, if you notice there's so much hate in this world that that's been, you know, I don't know if it's because of the media, you know, exploiting it, but there is so much hate, so much anger in this world, especially even in the United States alone, you know, like I've never seen it before. You know, when people are are taught to be like this or they're encouraged by conspiracy groups on the media or whatever the case may be, when when they have it in their head and they're taught and they keep following it, how do they how do you wake up that person to realize that, hey, this behavior, this environment you're living, these actions that you're taking are not healthy behaviors and they're just making the situation worse because in their eyes, it's the opposite what other people are doing are bad and what they're doing is for the good of society. Well, remember I said a carefully calibrated system? Yes. I have a long answer to that, but since you made the point in there as worth, I want to disagree a little bit. Uh -huh. When people act badly, it's not that they think that the people are acting nice or worse. It's more that they think the other people are unrealistic. Mm -hmm. If you think about what you say to your own kids, even a hip person like you, <laughs> if, you start, if they're being too nice in some current, you might say, well, you do have to protect your own interests. Mm -hmm. You're not saying that because you believe that's the way the world should be, but you know that is the way the world is. So you're saying it because you know it has to work, which leads back to my story about, you know, um, the movie. Yeah. People would prefer, and my book goes into detail, and I go into detail with you, but. The key point isn't you read my thing and say, well, this is highly improbable. It's a combination of changes. Yeah. So slowly go to that. You say, well, that's highly improbable. That's highly improbable. Oh, my God. My answer <laughs> is, I think my door blew up. That's okay. My answer is, yeah. My answer is, oh, my God, I lost my train of thought. Usually I, I never lose it, but I, because of the door blowing away. Um. We were talking about the different behaviors and, and that people exemplify. And then you were talking about how, you know, it's not, you know, like a parent, you tell their, your child to pre protect themselves. And um, it's not because you, you want them to live in a society, you know, it, because the society is a bad society. <clears throat> you know how the world is itself. Okay. Is so my saying. point is, if you read my book, the last third, mm -hmm. I have a whole bunch of lists of things that should be done. Some of them political, some of them interpersonal, mm -hmm. some family, you know, all, all different levels. Yes. And if you look at each of them individually, you would say, well, that's got a hundred to one chance. This has a 30 to one chance. If you multiply it out, it's a billion to one. It's ridiculous. Yeah. The answer is if people want to do it, if they want to get to the goal. I know when I talk about my book, now that it's actually out. Yeah. Part of why you get so many people is I talk to people in the street who say they want to do it and they hear the story. Everybody would like to be an angel in paradise, right? Right. I mean, it, they don't think it's realistic. So if I give them a list of things to do to do it and people believe it, they go, well, it is worth doing that, no matter how right. improbable. Now, I am going to have to say something that I'm going to now seem a little crazier than I was. <laughs> in reading the holy books, I believe for sure that God in the Bible, in Buddha sutras, in the Quran, and other holy books predicted that when the close of the age would come, he would anoint new prophets who, because they were speaking for God, if they said the same things I said and blessed would, would like be listened to. Yeah. And I think 
I hate to say this, but my book is about hope, but it's not totally about hope. Right. I think God himself, and I have reason for believing this, is negatively surprised that we haven't adapted at all. And when you really come down to it, it was largely obvious, really beginning when the atomic bomb was blown up. Mm -hmm. was first occurred. I mean, you saw the movie Oppenheimer and they focus on him, but really all the people involved in that project realize that this changes the nature of warfare. And as Einstein said, it suddenly changes the reason people should act differently. And yet we haven't. Right. And I think God himself is a little negatively surprised about that we haven't. And so I'm going to say something that sounds a little more Buddhist than Hindu. Mm -hmm. We're here for two reasons. Well, many reasons, but two big reasons. One reason is God was hoping that our society would evolve to replace him. That's why it says God will rest on the seventh day. But the second reason is, even if we can't do that, there are lessons to be learned from being in this world that can be applied somewhere else. Of course, from God's point of view, you can obviously create a different but similar society. And if you want to know the truth, since I've been 20, I guess what the main lesson is, and the older I get, the more sure it is. <laughs> I think the main lesson for all of us of living here is working cooperatively for mutually advantageous goals is an enlightened form of selfishness. Mm -hmm. In our world, the right way to be selfish isn't to beat the other guy up. Because then right. you'll beat up John and then Joe will beat you up. You know, yeah. the right way, even if you only are looking at things selfishly, is to work cooperatively. Yeah. And that's the lesson. And if we don't, I mean, God was hoping to intervene by anointing prophets and they would lead us in that direction. But if it doesn't, and the world falls apart in a catastrophe, which is where we're heading. Yeah. Then our souls will learn the lesson. That's right. why Jesus says, now I'm sounding like a fundamentalist, quoting the Bible. But I believe the Bible is absolutely right. You just got to understand it. He says something to the effect that do not worry about wars and rumors of wars because they're the beginning of the end times. Right. Hopefully, the fear of war and catastrophe will push us into acting better. If not... The world will be ruined and all of our souls will realize and God will create another world <laughs> and we'll do that. Of course, being I went this far into craziness and you haven't shut me off, the more interesting question is, why would God create a world that was on a knife edge? Meaning God himself wasn't sure if we would become more cooperative. I think the reason was that just because God created this universe mm -hmm. doesn't mean he feels comfortable managing it. It's like you with your children. You told me you have three children. Right. Now, you didn't tell me much about their personalities as they did for a living. But I'm sure of the three, and you don't want to admit this even to them, one of them is a little more different than you than the other two. Mm -hmm. But they're still your child. And just because you created them doesn't mean that you're exactly like them and you totally understand how, why they're acting this way. Right. I have two grandchildren. I may and my daughter talk about this, but they are so different. You wouldn't think they're brothers. Yeah. How'd that happen with the same mother and father and same <laughs> grandfather? I was a big influence in their life. Well, it did. And the point is from God's point of view, God realizes that he created this universe and is managing it, but he himself isn't in tune with its chaotic rhythms. Yeah. So he's a creative being who is in tune with the chaotic rhythms of this world, but at the same time understood that it's better to be cooperative and compassionate. Yeah. And he hoped that once we get to the atomic age, that we would begin to learn the lesson on our own, and then he'd make it go quicker by anointing prophets. Right. But he sees we're not. There are lots of individuals like you. Matter of fact, from doing this and writing letters to people like you about who will interview me, most of the people interview me agree with me. But of course, that's why they like me and they interview me. 
Yeah. I mean, most people don't think that way. Mm-hmm. They think the way you and I are thinking is a good idea, but it's unrealistic. And I'm afraid that God has decided that even his intervention wouldn't be enough to change the world. I mean, he could control our behavior, but that misses the whole point. Yeah. What he wanted was to guide us in the right direction, and we just don't want to be guided. Like the old saying, you can lead a horse to water and can't make a drink. So I'm giving you all these stories about how it can change, asking your people to buy my book. I'm not sure it's going to work. Right. I mean, I see some signs. I'm talking to you. You're a good sign. You've made a success of yourself and, and you know, by pushing ideas or some of mine. But then you see what's going on in the world. And I hate to bring it up, be specific, but I have a feeling you agree with me. You see all the people that follow Trump. I mean, where does that come from? <laughs> Forgetting about his specific policy. He says he's doing revenge. He's, I mean, like, where are the people that, that follow these conspiracies? Where do they come from? Mm-hmm. And there are so many, and it's not just in the US. I mean, how does Russia allow Putin to run it? How did China go from a country that was beginning to move toward a freer back to being, I would say, Z's a worse dictator than Mao? Yeah. Because Mao at least had a theory about how the human race could be. I read a lot of Mao's stuff, how the human race could be improved. Z is no theory. He's just a dictator. (laughs) You know? I mean, and it's not like the US, China, and Russia are the only places. All over the world, it's happening. Yes. And here's where I see a good point a silver lining and the bad line. The real reason that all these incredibly nationalistic me versus you people are gaining power is that I think almost ever in the world, in two big shots or nobodies, intuitively realizes that the way we're going just is not the best way. Right. But the natural reaction of humans, because of how we've lived in this world, for thousands of years is to move further toward fear and division. Mm -hmm. And therefore, that's why people who suggest that are gaining a following. But I think at one point, enough people realize this isn't working. Now, whether that point's before we've destroyed the world or not, that's another question. But at one point, I mean, that's the way evolution works. If God hadn't ever ever tried to intervene, which he really hasn't yet. Yeah. Eventually we would have learned that we have to be more cooperative. The problem is because of modern technology, we may destroy the world before we learn the lesson. Yeah. So, you know, but it is possible. I mean, there are signs of hope. I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't see there are signs. And I'm sure you see signs, but there's right. we have to be honest, it's not clear. It hangs on a knife edge, you know? Yeah. And um it can happen, and my book can. People buy my book; they'll have some suggestions for what to do. I'm equally interested, in, as I told you, I have a peace plan. Mm-hmm. And I, I already believe, for a lot of reasons, that world peace is the first thing, and that's the one area where I've actually. I ran an organization on UN reform in the 1990s when that was a big deal. Yeah, and that led me to come up with a solution that. People who were heads of state, not sitting at a table, before heads of state, loved. And then one of the most famous people I met gave me a suggestion for how it could involve Europe. And it happens that it relates to the, it can be tweaked. A Russian who likes my view had the think that tweaked it to make it something Putin might agree to to end the war. And I'm trying to sell it right now, right before I talk to you. I have people in England. There's reasons I I haven't think David Cameron is the right person to push my idea. For right. reasons related to his past. He's now the foreign minister of Britain and he was the prime minister, as you know. So I'm trying to get to him. And if he meets me, I think he'll say, you know what? What the hell? I'll try it. Because I have French big shots who like it. And I'm sure if I told you, you would like it. Mm-hmm. The reason I bring up French is it involves the veto of the UN and the EU, and not France, the only country that has both. It's involved with the veto of the UN and the EU. And so they have the right country, and they're t- they're literally most experienced diplomat, likes my idea, but it doesn't have the courage to bring them a cron because they're pros and cons. Right. But 
for Britain, it's clearly a winner, and it's related to Cameron's own history. So I'm trying. I'm not giving up. I, I'm not giving up. There's hope for the human race, but it hangs on a, a thin reed. Yeah, I agree. There is hope. And what would be some of your uh, suggestions if you had to tell listeners, you know, the best way for cooperation, the best way for peace, you know, people who yearn to have it and maybe they need some direction and guidance on how they can. Well, without getting into my, I mean, you have to read my book, get all of them, but I'm going to say something that has nothing to do with peace, nothing to do with changing families. It's just behavior Mm -hmm. that relates to you and me. It can relate to you and your family. It can relate to companies. It can relate to the world. Right. I believe, and I believe Jesus and Buddha took this attitude. The right way to act is what I call deferential assertiveness. Mm -hmm. You should tell people what you want, but don't be obsessed with getting it. Give in if you want. Mm -hmm. And then when, let's say, two people that both believe in it still are questioning, say you and I were questioning something, then you go to something called the primary actor rule. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if you and I are arguing about what should happen, let's say I'm an evil rapist and you're a woman. You are one, right? And I'm stronger than you, so I want to rape you. You could make, but I still believe in a better world, even though you could say, you know, I know you may think, well, you want to rape me, so you get what you want, but I'm the one who's going to be affected by this more than you because you're going to get your nuts off forever 10 minutes and it'll be over. But this is going to affect me psychologically the rest of my life. And of course, if I get pregnant, I'll do other things. And if I'm fair, I'd say, yeah, you're right. You're the primary actor. So my point is that first you go with deferential assertiveness. If you can't solve an issue with that, then go to the primary actor rule. Whoever's the main one affected negatively, they should get their way. Mm-hmm. And then if it's still questionable, then you go to the obvious. How is the greater good served? How right, will the right. world as a whole benefit? But they benefit from yours or mine. And if you do those three things honestly, you can basically resolve any dispute, any right. disagreement. It can show you a way forward in almost any situation. And I have that in the book. I mean, in the book is a lot more specific suggestions, but that really gets into how families restructured, the details of my peace plan. You know, that's a lot of other things. Yeah. But this is really a simple thing that can be used in every aspect of living. And I bet you're the kind of person who will appreciate it and maybe use it in your life. Mm-hmm. I would. Does that make sense to you? It does make sense to me. Yeah. Boy, you like all my ideas. I do like a lot of your ideas. I, I probably, most of them, I, you know, for me, I believe we're not controlled by the brain. We're controlled by the heart, but not many people are intuitive enough to listen to their heart and they get influenced by their environment. They get influenced by other people and they get, they don't, you know, we're, we're people really need to look inside themselves. And, and like you said, you know, most, most people, you know, why is there dictatorship? Why is there, you know, people who are doing bad things and leading, you know, bad things to happen? Well, other people follow for, because of fear, because they're afraid what's going to happen to them if they don't follow this person. You know, I'm going to say something similar to that, but a little different. Once again, starting with something Jesus said. Jesus said, speaking about himself too, but about all humans, with my heart or with my mind, I serve the law of God. With my body, I serve the law of sin. Mm-hmm. Now, with that in the background, I'm going to tell you something related to that. I've read a lot of books on brain studies and I think the reason it appears we almost have two minds, and some people that study the brain says it does appear that way, is that we have our animal brain, which all animals have, and which is basically hooked in through our nervous system to our body. Mm -hmm. Our body gives it signals and it says what to do. That's our animal brain. Yeah. But our animal brain and our soul combine to make our mind. Mm -hmm. And our mind is much more loving. Yes. Our mind, and that's because our soul knows from living in with the Godhead that really you benefit more by being loving and kind. Yeah. And and our heart is really listening to our soul. What you're calling a heart is really your soul speaking through your emotions. Mm-hmm. And so that gets back to everything I said that we all would like to allow our heart. I mean, that's why love is 
what is all culture about? Mm -hmm. A little bit's about killing and evil and stuff, but really the, the parts of culture that everyone likes are about connection, mm -hmm. either love or empathy, well, it's art or music. Now it's true that a lot of dramatic stories involve people contending for power, but the things people really gravitate towards are about what our heart and soul want us to be the way you're saying. Mm -hmm. And even the stories of contention, which is what most like movies or books have a subplot. In the end, most good books or movies has either the good guy wins or someone that wasn't so good wins, but he learns a lesson yeah. about how it would be nice to have friends and love people. And the point I'm making is that resonates with us. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's looked at as good culture and stories, whatever. Because that basic story resonates with us. Right. And so we only go the other way because we feel someone's going to hurt us. Right. Like it happened to me just the other day. I'm sure it's happened to you where I'm asleep and a loud noise only happens and you get nervous. You think, oh my God, it's a robber. Is it? <laughs> Tree, it just happened now with the wind. Oh yeah, my God, yeah. you're thinking, oh my God, something bad can happen. And then you're, you're feeling negative. But you have to like overcome that. And, and in most cases, you can, because the worst that's going to happen is you're going to die. And yeah. if you die, you might be in heaven. So that's not so bad. And so the point is, as Buddha, as I said, I went all holy books, as Buddha and Hinduism teach, this life is illusion. Maya, it's only here to teach us lessons. Right. And if we all learn a lesson together, we'll create a better world and we can become stronger and replace God running the universe. If we don't, as individuals, our souls learn a lesson. And that's basically the story. That's amazing. Anyway, I do want to be able to remind people how they can get my book. Yes, please do. Well, the easy way is on Amazon or bookstores, whatever. But because I've gotten a lot of orders and they're surprised at Amazon, sometimes it's slower. You can order from my printer. It's called Book Babies. And you look in their bookstore and look up the same thing. But their website isn't as good as Amazon. So if you have trouble, go to Amazon. Okay. But it's called Book Babies. You can get it quicker that way. It's the price is the same. Becoming and it's also available as an ebook. So you don't you and so you can either get on Amazon or other places, Barnes and Noble, wherever, or you can go to Book Babies. And all you got to look up on Amazon is Becoming Angels in Paradise. You don't have to remember my name. Just remember <laughs> the name of the book. And you just type it in in Amazon Books and it'll show up. That's wonderful. I, I think you're you're on a, a really good track. I've been very inspired by a lot of the things you have to say today. Um, you know, I, uh, I agree with a lot of the things you, you've said and I, um, you know, I, it is cooperation is key. Love is key. Communication is key. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, I'd love to have you back on the show. You have, uh, really, you know, presented yourself really well with, and really have shared some really good key points. And, you know, I'd like to expand on those. Maybe we could have you back in the future. Anytime you want. You can, you can write, you got my email, we can communicate and I'll send you my um, website. But as I said, uh, in terms of you putting it on your thing, I don't mind people writing my email directly. I mean, yes, I get I'll a lot of emails, that. I like to read them. I mean, I, I don't mind. I mean, that's how, to tell you the truth, I did have ideas when I was 18, but my book, my ideas and my peace plan all come from feedback. I right. like people to give me feedback, including negative feedback, because that's how you learn. If What's I'm a, your email address? Oh, you want me to say it? Yes. Yeah. It's my name, Benjamin.Freeman at Verizon.net. Benjamin okay. spelled like Ben Franklin, Freeman at Verizon.net. Okay. But I may end by telling you about someone that isn't thought as good in America, but I think he was a good thinker. He didn't know what to do. Mao Zedong, who did create a revolution in the biggest country in the world, so obviously he had some idea how to motivate people, he said that criticism and self-criticism is how you learn. It is. 
And the reason I say that is most people don't realize that. And that's yeah. why they don't grow. Right. Most people look at criticism as an attack. Yes. But the truth is, even to the extent it is an attack, it doesn't mean you can't learn from it. Right. And that's how you grow. It does. And so how that relates to my email, I want people who read my book. I have my email address in the book. And I hope Amazon won't not sell anymore. And I say, but they don't like it. But they just didn't notice it in my book. I shouldn't say it because maybe one of them will tell me that. <laughs> that I want people to read that book to give me, and not to say I thought it was wonderful, to say, well, I mean, it got some very good reviews, but I want to hear negative. Right. Matter of fact, my worst review gave me very good feedback. Mm -hmm. My worst review, I remember what the guy said, he said, I give it four out of five stars because I love his basic points. But it seemed to me that he was making a lot of statements as though they're real, but he wasn't backing them up. And can I say one more thing to answer his review? Sure. As I told you before the show, I, this is like the 10th iteration of my book. And my next to last one, I got one of the biggest publishing houses through an agent to read. And what they said to me was, this book is too fundamentally intelligent to be published by the mainstream press. And part how there are different ways I sort of dumbed down the book and made it clearer without making it missing my points. Right. But one way I did was I took out the footnotes. Mm -hmm. The original book was footnoted. The problem is, because I create footnotes by looking at what Buddha said, what modern science says, and I compare them and say, well, the only thing that makes... I had footnotes that were two pages long, mm -hmm. and every other paragraph was footnote. So it was really a footnote book. The book itself, <laughs> no longer than this book, mm -hmm. which is a normal size, but there were a thousand pages of footnotes. Right. And they, they were right. I mean, no one's going to read the book like that. I mean, yeah. it, so I basically took the footnotes out, and therefore... It looks like a lot of my controversial points, like it seems like he's just saying this. What is his basis? Right. But if you write me about every, any one of my controversial points, I will tell you where I came up with them. I, the way I generally did is I overlapped what, to use Noah's Ark story as an example. Mm hmm the Quran retells the story of the slight change without me getting into what it, I think it's about, as you can read in my book. Right. I take the biblical story, I take the Quranic story, and then I take overlapping secular evidence. Mm -hmm. and I say, how can all three of them be right? right. How can what the Quran be right, what the Bible be right, and the early, and I come up with a solution. Right. And in this book, I just say it, but to footnote that, as you can imagine, that's not like just saying, see page 46 of the Bible. It's like, well, the Bible says this, the Quran says this, and this side, you know, and it's like, it's a page, it's a footnote, one sentence. Yeah. And so if anyone thinks some ideas are interesting, but where did I come up with them? I'm more than happy to write me and I'll tell you where I came up with them. And maybe you'll show me I'm wrong. I want to learn. <laughs> it was I lovely love to meet you, Steve. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for being on the show. And I hope to have you back soon. Anytime you want, write me. All righty. I'll write you with the stuff you want. Okay. Uh, nice to pleasure. talk to you. Nice to talk have to you. Have a good day and say hello to your husband and three lovely children. Thank you. And have a great day also. Okay. Thank you very much. There's my book. Goodbye. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>